Okay, it's good to have everybody here this evening. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer and the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are a forgiving God and that we don't have to do anything meritorious in order to get back into your good grace. All we have to do is acknowledge our sins, to humble ourselves and acknowledge our sins. We are back in fellowship with you right away. What a gracious and phenomenal God that we worship. We thank you for your word, that it is alive and powerful. We pray that you will help us to have an open mind and not be distracted by anything else because what we go through here in Romans chapter 8 is so important. Uh, But you have to have background, you have to concentrate. So we pray that you will help us do this this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've gone back just a little bit into what we see in Lesson 242. And it has to do with the golden chain. Do you all remember what the golden chain is? Anybody? Okay, I'm glad I went back here. (laughs) I've got a big question mark over on somebody's head. This is... The golden chain is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. There are five links to the chain, and they are in this order, foreknown, or foreknew, foreknowledge, just pick one, predestination, predestined, not until I get through with this part. (laughs) <laughs> I'm trying to see if this rings a bell with somebody. I'll put it on in just a second. Uh, the third one is called. So far we have foreknowledge, predestination, and called. Those are three of the links. The fourth one is justification. And the five, fifth one is, glorifica- uh, is uh, ju- glorification. Okay, I'll put it on there now. There it is. Can y'all see that? Let's see if I can go to view and get this top part off so we can see um, what happens. There we go. Okay. We talked about Theodore Beza, Calvin's successor, and he's the one that kind of took this, uh, some of the things that Calvin had done, and really I think he made a mess of them, but he was right in seeing these as a as the golden ch- uh, chain. So we're looking at verse 30, uh, uh, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, And these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. Now, you'll notice, I brought this to your attention before, you see the words, he also, he also, he also, he also, four times it's saying that those whom he foreknew, He also predestinated, and he called. And then it says, and whom? Just look at this this part that you're looking at where the the five words in red. You'll see before foreknew, it says for whom he foreknew. And then we have predestinated, and he's also predestined. And these he also 
called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now this is a way to show that no one is lost in this whole, in this whole, uh, I guess you would say, mission that Jesus Christ was on to enable us to do this. Every person that God foreknew was also predestined. And everyone that was predestined was called, and every one of them who were called were justified, and every one of them that were justified, were they were also glorified. And I also want to point out to you that God is the one responsible for this whole thing to work. He is the one that moves us from foreknowledge to predestined to call to justified and glorified. And the main thing I want to show you is it all starts with his foreknowledge. This is where so many people get mixed up. If you go to the average believer and you ask them, what do you know about the divine decrees? Your answer will probably be, what? The what? They don't know or never even heard of the divine decrees. Of course, you know that. It's what the Godhead came together before the earth was even created and decided that they were going to separate the things that they knew would happen as a reality from all the things that could happen that won't happen. And the way they did that, that they decreed from their knowledge, their foreknowledge, the things that would come to pass. And the really important part is to know that they didn't do anything to cause anything in the divine decrees. All they did was reveal it through God's omniscience and even more specifically, his foreknowledge, which is a subset of his, his overall knowledge because there's nothing that God doesn't know. But a lot of people would like to start with <coughs> for whom he predestined. Because they think God predestined everything that is in the divine decrees. And then they go to sovereignty and say, that's why he's able to do it. He's sovereign. He can do anything he wants to. And the first thing that he did was predestine those that he chose to save. The only problem, it doesn't say that, and it starts with foreknowledge. Do you understand how important that is that you can make that distinction? Because that's what it's all about. Here's another part I'd like to go over. This part right here, this paragraph. To predestine is simply to plan in advance. The call referred to here is the efficacious call to come to him. What does efficacious mean? It comes from the root to be effective. Because God's call goes out to all mankind through the gospel. But the great number of them, most of them by far, the call is not efficacious, it's not effective because they turn the call down. The call is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they rather depend on their own works and most of them don't want to have anything to do with recognizing Jesus Christ as their God and their Savior because they're afraid it's going to somehow hamper their life and the way they live it. They don't want to be answerable to anybody. They want to do what they want to do. And they're afraid that if they believe in Jesus Christ, they'll have to go to church and sit there and be bored and have to be moral, they can't do some of the sinning that they have done before. And so they say, no, thank you. I think I'll live my life like I want to. You only come around one time anyway. There's only one life. And I'm going to do it my way. Frank Sinatra, and I did it my way. <laughs> I don't know if he's a believer or not, but anyway. So we're talking about an effective call are the ones who respond to the gospel. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
All those whom God foreknew would believe and are predestined. Why are they predestined? Because God's foreknowledge knew what was in the divine decrees before anything ever even started, before the world was created. And therefore, he predestined them because he knew exactly everything that was in the divine decrees. Because God foreknew they would believe, he calls them, all those who are predestined are called, and all those who are called are justified. This calling is an effectual calling. Effectual. It is effective because those who he foreknew responded to the call. Most people don't. And all those who are justified will be glorified. This refers to the redemption of our bodies at the last day on Romans chapter 8 verse 23. Okay, I'm, you see this last verse here is John 10, 27 through 29. I had a question on this and so I want, I know we've already gone over it, but I need to go over it again because it's a little bit tricky. <coughs> This is John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now follow me closely here. Experimental, experimentalists will say the following. These are people who are into Reformed theology. They will say the following. Lifelong obedience is the characteristic of all who truly believe and it is not a condition. What does that mean? It means these people think that this is not a condition that one must meet. It's one that automatically happens to them if you're one of the ones who are called. Characteristics are all, all who truly believe. Just forget, don't ever, I hope you don't ever use that term. They use it all the time, but you're either, it's like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. And when it comes to being saved, to believe, either you believe or you don't. But in any case, it's not a condition. But obedience is not a characteristic of all who believe, as the scripture clearly teaches. So in other words, there's no believer who is going to have a lifelong life of obedience. None of us, some of us can't make it a day without being disobedient. Some, maybe an hour, they can't make it. So they're saying that you follow Christ by living a lifelong life of obedience. And, that's, and you'll do that if you are truly such. But obedience is not a characteristic of all who believe as Scripture teaches. To follow, see up here where it says, and they follow me. See that? To follow is simply another of John's metaphors for to believe. He has also used look, taste, eat, and drink. These are all metaphors also of believing. Are literal eating, looking, tasting, and drinking necessary for eternal life? No, of course not. Now the reason saying that is because they are taking this and they follow me literally. And he's saying that uh, to follow is simply another John's metaphors to believe. In other words, if you instead of saying uh, 
and they believe me. He says, follow me. And this is saying that follow is another metaphor whether it is to look, taste, eat, and drink. All those are metaphors for believing as well. And so, I ask the question, are literal eating, looking, tasting, and drinking necessary for eternal life? No, why? Because they're literal. The Bible uses them as metaphors as to believe. When we, when we take communion, the Lord's Supper, and we drink that drink, is that drink that we drink, is that what matters? Is that what puts us close to Christ? No, it's just a drink. But it symbolizes our what? Our belief, our trust in Christ. Is this coming across now? So hardly, no, they do, the, the literal ones do not. Neither is literal following. Literal following is not what is necessary to prove that you're going to be obedient your entire life. Let's take it literal. To follow the shepherd is to believe on him. Y'all got that? Okay. All right, let's go get down here. This is our lesson for tonight. This is the last part of Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, I have the firstborn in red. And that word has caused a lot of people to vibrate and misunderstand the verse. So let's look what it is. The firstborn in the Greek is prototokos. P-R-O-T-O-T-O-K-O-S. Prototokos. And it's the adjective. It's a, a singular masculine accusative. Accusative singular masculine. It just means it's the uh, direct object. And it means pertaining to being firstborn, the, a firstborn child, normally in context speaking of people, but also used in reference to do, uh, domestic animals. Now the Bible uses it so many times for that de uh, definition. So if you're the firstborn, it would take it that you are the firstborn, and it's talking about males because the females did not enter into this uh, about the firstborn. So speaking of the firstborn, now, in Jewish society, the rights and responsibilities of being a firstborn son resulted in considerable prestige and status. And we've been seeing that. But what did we notice about so many times the firstborn winds up not getting the inheritance and the double portion? It's the secondborn. Can you think of any? How about Esau and Jacob? Who was first? Esau. What was Jacob called coming out of the room, womb? What is it, what what is they refer to? A heel grabber. <laughs> How would you like to go through life? What's your name, heel grabber? <laughs> anyway, just making a point there. Now this next paragraph is the one most important in this. The figurative meaning of prototokos in the messianic title. What does the messianic title mean? It's talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So when it is used, when referring to him, all those other things aren't even applying. It's special when it's talking about him. So the figurative meaning of pro Protoktokos in the Messianic title, and it just gives the same word again, first bur uh, firstborn of all creation in Colossians 1.15, it says that. It says that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. In Colossians 1.15. May be interpreted as existing before all creation or existing superior to all creation. So when you're, when you're talking about 
first born with Jesus Christ, it's not talking about all the normal ways that it is used of being the first born and having uh, the inheritance and double portion and all that. It's completely different. Doesn't have any, in fact, it doesn't have anything to do with that. So we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. You see it up here on the board. You can turn there if you want to. I've got a couple of paragraphs on this. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 will blow your doors off. It's explaining and defining Jesus Christ in a way that is just spectacular. He's the one that created the world and everything in it. It was created by him and for him and all things hold together through him. And then it says, he is the firstborn of all creation. Okay, now look up here. Y'all, are y'all, if you're at Colossians 1.15, pertaining to the existing prior to something else. This is the, giving you the definitions here. Pertaining to existing prior to something else. Existing first. Existing before. Protoktokos. And then you have uh, Pesos. And Ketiso. Those are just a few Greek words there. And then it says, existing before all creation or existing before anything was created. We're talking about what this word means in Colossians 1.15. It is possible to understand Protoktokos in Colossians 1.15 as as a superior, superior in status. So when you go here and see firstborn of all creation, it means existing before anything else. And you can understand it as a superior status. It has nothing to do with physical birth. Got that? I'm going to read this first. Uh, then I'll drop it down. Look at the verse again. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So what do the Jehovah Witnesses do? And they're not the only ones that do this. They think that Jesus Christ was created at that point. He's the firstborn of all creation. And it's, well, you see, he's created being. He can't be God because he's been created. That's what they say. So here's my paragraph here. Joseph Witnesses wrongly add the word other six times in the passage in their New World Translation, thus they suggest that Christ created all other things after he was created. But the word other is not in the Greek, original Greek text. So they're saying that he was created himself. So, I'll show you the top part now. The first, part, the first born cannot be part of creation if he created all things, which he did, and it states in Romans 1.1 1, 1 and Colossians 1.16, that he created everything that was made, and anything that uh, was made was made by him. So one cannot create himself, can, can one? Hmm? I mean, if you don't exist yet, how can you create somebody else, or even create yourself? You can't do it. Does that be, so that is a, should suffice in showing that their attack on Christianity and Christ is saying that he is not God. He's a, he's a, he was a good guy, but he's not God. Well, that melts because of this firstborn isn't about being born. We just saw in first, in first, in Colossians 1.15, that it means he was before creation and existed before anything was created and uh, <clears throat> before anything even existed. Now, firstborn denotes two things about Christ. Number one, he preceded the whole creation. And number two, he is sovereign over all creation. Now I'm giving you these things so I don't have I wouldn't have to put these verses in I could have left them out 
Sure enough, as soon as I did that, you would be talking to somebody about Jesus Christ and he was the firstborn and before eternity and everything. And they say, oh, yeah, but he created himself. Oh, yeah, well, that's a good trick. Okay, now, Colossians 1.18. Three verses above this, we see firstborn again. Yes. The second what? Oh, he is sovereign over all creation. So he preceded the whole creation, and he is sovereign over all creation. And how could he not be? He's created everything. And what did he create it out of? Nothing. Try that sometime. Have you heard the joke about Satan and Jesus Christ was going to have a contest? Who could who could build build the biggest sandcastle? And and Satan was going to go first. You see, he he went in there, started digging in the sand, and, and Jesus said, "Get your own sand, make your own sand." I'm sorry, that was just funny. It does uh, kind of illustrate the point, though, doesn't it? Yeah, the first thing he had to do was create sand out of nothing, and then he'd be on his way. <laughs> So the uh, here's Colossians 1.18. He also, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything, which is exactly what it should be. But I have underlined here, the firstborn from the dead. Now, that's different than verse 15. We have to look at that. The Old Testament predicted Christ's coming. The gospel announced that he came. And the remaining scriptures predict his coming again. I like that, don't you? This is talking about, in a very capsule form, that the Old Testament predicted Christ's coming. That's all they did. They were, they were, that's what all the sacrifices were about. So much about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And it was, prophesying when he came and what he would do. And the Gospels announced that he came. John the Baptist was the herald. He would go through and they'd blow the horns and they would say, uh, repent for the, uh, for the, repent for the uh, kingdom is, is near. And, and he was, and, and it was near because the king had arrived. The word firstborn has nothing to do with the first Christmas. Nowhere does the Bible teach that Jesus' life began in Bethlehem. His physical being began there, but not his person. Jesus Christ became human in Bethlehem, but he was a person of the Godhead in eternity past. So, firstborn implies both Christ's priority to all creation in time and his sovereignty over all creation in rank. But I know I haven't touched about being firstborn of the dead yet. I'm going there now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits." of those who are asleep. And that is really saying exactly the same thing that we see in our verse, where he is the beginning, the first firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. It's just said in a different way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Being raised from the dead, he was the first fruits of those who sleep. First fruits and the firstborn both are really explaining the same thing. Jesus Christ was first born from the dead in the sense that he was the first and only one who has been resurrected from the grave. He was the first born, meaning that he was the first to be resurrected from the grave. Now you need to really inculcate this. 
Because most people think that there have been many who have been resurrected. They talk about Lazarus was resurrected. They talk about when Christ was crucified and the veil was rent in the temple from top to bottom. And there were people who came out of the graves and they say they were resurrected. But it's easy to explain. Jesus Christ is the only one who was resurrected because all these other people, and there's a few more illustrations, were people who were resuscitated. They didn't get a new resurrection body. They were resuscitated into their old body when they uh, got up and like... uh, Lazarus came to life and so forth. But they subsequently died again. Jesus Christ is the only one to this moment who has a resurrected body. He was the firstborn of the dead. He was the firstfruits of those who are asleep, meaning those who are dead. Any questions so far? Okay. So far far we looked at verse 15, firstborn of all creation. 18, firstborn from the dead. And now in Hebrews 1, 6 it says, And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, He says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now you see the word firstborn there. Once you turn to Hebrews 1 6, and you might make a little notation here. Hebrews 1 6, I'll give you time to go to it. This was easy to to address. If you're at Hebrews 1.6, then follow me as I expand, as I read, fill in a few things. And when He, this is God the Father, what I do is put a capital G and a capital F. God the Father, when He, God the Father, again brings the firstborn to the world. What is that meaning? He says, what does the world word again mean? It means the Father has already brought him into the world once already. That one place is talking about his physical birth. But now we're talking about he's going to bring him again to the world for the second time. And he says, and he again brings the firstborn into the world. Now, I want to ask you something. I see y'all are, are I hope you're not reading ahead. I hope you're staying with me. Okay? What does it mean he again brings the firstborn into the world? Is that referring to the rapture? No takers. No. He again brings the firstborn into the world. He's talking about the second advent. Because at that point, Jesus Christ is returning to the world and he's going to be on the world. He's going to be on earth. That doesn't happen at the rapture. And also, he says... And let the angels of God worship him. God forbids worship to man. And Jesus Christ had hundreds and thousands of people worshiping him on earth. He never 
told him not to do that. Why? Because he's God. Okay, so let's let's put it. This verse refers to when Jesus Christ, the firstborn, will return to earth again for the second time at the second advent. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just got a report that we're having a little trouble here with our live streaming that it's buffering, meaning it's taking longer, it might slow down or whatever. And I don't know, uh, when that, that, that's not normal, but it's sometimes we don't know what's next going to happen when we're live streaming. We had a long run of not problems, but here recently we've had some. So it's not your computer. It's the streaming that's coming in. Okay, are y'all all on board with that? You understand that? So now we have the firstborn, Jesus Christ, coming to the world for the second time. And now we have, I've got one more here, which is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. See, we have to, we can't just take uh, that Christ is the firstborn and say, okay, well... Let's move on. Because everybody would think it's talking about his birth, which it isn't. And we have to look at each one of these contexts to understand what it means by the firstborn. Because it's different in different contexts. I mean, in different scriptures. So in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, so here we have again the firstborn of the dead. The phrase firstborn of the dead is part of the description of Jesus Christ as being first to receive a resurrection body. Okay, that's the last of the verses that I have in this portion right here. The purpose of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ is so that we might be, be the firstborn among many brethren. All of us are the many brethren. I'm talking about our verse up here. that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now we're talking about us. And when we get down here, the purpose of being conformed to the image of Christ, this is in verse 29, those who he foreknow, those he also uh, predestined, and those who he predestined, he called, and it goes on from there. But the purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So the purpose of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ is so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. All of us are that many, are, 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 are the many brethren. Jesus Christ will not be by himself when he rules and reigns over coming kingdoms. He will have a cadre of qualified believers from all centuries of the church age who will rule and reign with him. So when we get to this part here where it's talking about that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, in this case, what is the firstborn talking about? Yeah, the first one with the resurrection body, but... <coughs> Right now, and when he, when his kingdom comes, if if this wasn't here, if if he wasn't the firstborn among many brethren, what kind of what kind of thing would that be? He would go into his kingdom by himself. Is that something that sounds like God would do? No, it isn't. And so we, we when we get down here, we see 
Jesus Christ will not be by himself when he rules and reigns over his coming kingdom. He will have a cadre of qualified believers. What does that mean? Not all believers are going to rule and reign with him. Only those who are going to be molded to the image of Jesus Christ, his son, which you could call it those who reach spiritual maturity. Those who are going to endure to the end. We'll get into some scriptures like that in a moment. He will have a cadre of un, uh, qualified believers from the centuries of the church age who will rule and reign with him. I thought before, well, we're in the church age and all the believers we have right now, of all the people on earth, how many believers are those that are qualified to rule and reign with him who have been uh, changed into uh, the image of Christ? How many would that be? I mean, we don't. God knows, but we don't know. But if you had a guess, just for our, we're talking about the ones on earth right now, how many would you think it would be? Give me a guess. Two? <laughs> well, uh, I hope the two lucky ones are in there because. <laughs> how about percentage wise? How many believe there would be 1%? I think that's kind of high. I'm talking about mature believers. It could be. I don't know. It's his guess. But let's, let's just say there, if we said there were 100,000, you think that could be in the ballpark maybe? Now, we're not just talking about believers who go to church and are good people and read the Bible and do all We're talking about those who are spiritually mature and endure to the end. Too many? Uh, let's just use that as a figure, okay? 100,000. Now, how many ages, how, how, how many, what would you say, uh, this is a generation. Let's say this is a generation. If you go back 2,000 years and look at those generations, and you, uh, we don't know how many there would be, there'd be a lot, wouldn't it? I used to think that when he's talking about those who are going to reach spiritual maturity, and we'll rule and reign with them. I thought about the people we have on here. But this, this right here made me change my mind. He will have a cadre of qualified believers from all centuries of the church age who will rule and reign with him. I just thought that was, it meant something to me because I never sat down and thought. Uh, have you ever thought, sat down and thought about how many believers are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ? When did the church age begin? Pentecost. When was Pentecost? 50 days after Christ was resurrected, right? So from that point on till now, how many are we talking about? A lot. 100,000 and not that many, you would think. But anyway, I just thought that was something that you owned. But here is going to unfold a little more information. This is from Kenneth Boa and William Crudinier, Romans Volume 6. He's, this is what they say. God was not satisfied to have a family with an only child, indeed. The entire human family, all the descendants of Adam and Eve, were to, were to have been his family, walking in fellowship with him for eternity. Now, this is what God had envisioned. This was his plan. Did it play out that way? No. But since the rebellion of man, it has been his position to redeem a family for himself out of the fallen race. So he has a family, but then he has cer certain ones that are going to have inheritance. And it's going, they are going to rule and reign with him as well. That's what this is talking about. What did you say? Extended family. Okay, and then God's ultimate purpose is not just perfected individuals, but a community of brothers and sisters, and therefore a family. Jesus will be the firstborn among many brethren, and that's in Ark verse, chapter 8, verse 29. Questions? Are you getting it? 
I was, one question I didn't ask yet. Okay. Can you catch this? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So the the question I'm thinking about is we're referring to the church the church age movement. Yes. Well, that that's that's a fact, uh, but what's what's the the main thing that we could zero in that makes us different than the other uh, dispensations is that we are indwelt by the whole Trinity, and that we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, which permanently identifies with Jesus Christ. And that's why we even have the high honor to receive our resurrection bodies before the Old Testament believers do. Old Testament believers are the uh, children of God as well. But they're not identified with Jesus Christ. They're not in Christ. We can't hear. So are the medical age student the number of church age believers? Or are they yes. No. Church age. Yeah. But I was going to ask you a question here. Said, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I didn't look this up as far as the scriptures. Thank you. But I imagine that this is a subjunctive mood. You, did you notice that? The end of verse 29 says that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I better not mess with that until I'm able to go to the Greek and look at the um, the morphology of that he might be. Be is what it would be. Yes. Well, that's why I need to look at it. Do you have a New American Standard there? That's probably... Uh, see, <clears throat> I got this part here. Well, I'll need more than just... Uh, if, if it says that he would be, of course, that's different than might be. But that I'll, I'll address that first thing next time. That's not Old Testament believers. No. You have you have some uh, believers that are in the uh, tribulation under the throne that are asking how much longer does this have to go on before Christ is going to come at the second advent and cut it off. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll look it up backwards, okay? Yes. Well, I'm looking at the word might be. Yeah. That's got to be a verb. Do you have the morphology of it there? What? Say it again. Oh, okay. Present active or infinitive. An infinitive doesn't have a, mo a mood. It has, uh, it supports a finite uh, verb which says, a, fi a finite verb has a, a, a tense voice and mood. The mood is what has to do with reality. It's a finite verb, but if you have a, an infinitive or a participle, it doesn't have a mood. So you can't tell if it's uh, what the mood is, whether it's a, uh, uh, indicative, or whether it's a uh, maybe a, a whole list of them. 
So we can't tell. We can't tell what it is because it doesn't. The mood is what gives you whether it's a, a subjunctive or a, or a in, in, imperative or what it is. So, but I'll, I I don't want to bore us with it except for here at the last. I'll look it up and tell you for sure what it all it is, what what it is. Uh, but I just saw that and I thought, hmm. We'll look at that next time. So, do you understand how important it is the 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 to look at a a, a word like the firstborn, and not just look at one one place of it. Now, if, if you looked in the Bible, if you went in and ran a scan on how many times the word firstborn is used in the Bible, it would probably be in the hundreds, maybe even thousands. I don't know, because when you get into the genealogy, and a lot of times they say so-and-so was the firstborn. It goes on and on like that. But when we went to that, when we were uh, going through this paragraph, uh, that was talking about, here it is right here, this paragraph is important. Because it says, the figurative meaning of prototokos in the messianic title, that throws everything into another realm because it's talking about Jesus Christ and it's completely different from arguing about whether Jesus Christ was the firstborn uh, or created as the firstborn, whatever you want to call it, because it doesn't have anything to do with that. When you're talking about Jesus Christ, he's the Messiah. And he has a unique life. You can't take a word that applies to things that are normal and, and, and put it on him. So he's the first, uh, may say in time, the firstborn of all creation in Colossians 1.15 may be interpreted as existing before all creation or existing spiritual. Let me tell you something. Do you know where I got my information from Colossians 1.15? I taught Colossians 1.15. And I went to my notes in Colossians 1.15 and started reading them. I have to say they're pretty good. And they're, they're just all inspiring. In fact, if you go to verse 115 in Colossians and you go online, and one, you see the book Colossians, you open it up, you scroll down to 115, and there's a big part there that says the firstborn. Of the, and, and that whole area is so rich in the high quality, the uniqueness, and the phenomenal Savior that we have. And so I just thought I'd throw that in because uh, that's 115. Then you can just scroll down three verses and you have 118. That was the next one we have right here. 118 is firstborn from the death. Okay? All right, we're uh, out of time, essentially. Do y'all have any any other questions or comments or anything? Okay. We, we spent most of the time on this firstborn. But if you're going to do it right and nail down all the things that are important, you have to take the time and go through it. And now when somebody says, oh, well, Jesus Christ was the firstborn. He wasn't a God. He was born as a human. Not even talking about it. Okay, let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that your word is absolutely perfect. Every jot, every tittle. We pray that you will help us to think about these things. Because if we don't think about them, we're going to forget them. And when we forget them, then we can't be a good and faithful servant. Our goal is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You are the one that makes it happen. We are the ones that will use our volition to where it's going to happen or not. But it can't happen without the Holy Spirit and without knowing your word. So we thank you for all of this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.